All right, the next section is involving amino acid metabolism. So in this section, we're going to be dealing with a lot of material. Okay, there's a lot of very important board material in this particular section. So let's go ahead and get rolling. The first thing we're going to do is overview the concept of amino acid degradation. Okay, there's a few common themes that you should think about before we go into further detail. So let's take a look here. With amino acid degradation, the idea is, is that you have proteins, and proteins, of course, are going to be degraded to individual amino acids. Now, in order to degrade proteins into an amino acids, you have to break a special type of bond. Okay, what was that bond? That's a peptide bond. A peptide bond is basically an amide linkage that holds the amino acids together. And there's going to be enzymes that are called proteases that are going to do the job of breaking these, these peptide bonds. So once the, the proteases can break the proteins into individual amino acids, basically all an amino acid is is a carbon skeleton that's linked to an amino group. Okay, so amino acids, I want you to think of them as having a carbon skeleton linked to an amino group. How are the, and, and these are going to be dealt with separately. Okay, so the carbon skeletons, the carbon skeletons are going to be utilized either for energy, to generate energy, or they're going to be utilized to synthesize other compounds, other compounds. And we'll be spending a great deal of time in this section talking about those other compounds that the carbon skeletons of, of proteins can be used for. Now, the amino group that breaks off of the amino acid ends up turning into ammonia. Okay, it turns into ammonia or ammonium, ammonium being NH4+, the form that would usually predominate. But the point is, is that ammonia is toxic. It's a molecule that's very toxic to the cell. So the body has to get rid of it. Okay, so the body has a way of getting rid of its nitrogen waste products. And of course, that's going to be, okay, it's going to be through the urea cycle. The ammonia is either going to be excreted through the urea cycle, or it's going to be excreted as it is in the kidney. Most ammonia, though, is going to end up being converted to urea through the urea cycle and be, be excreted that way. But some free ammonia can be released from the kidney. So that's the overview. Okay, that's the overview of amino acid degradation. Think of protein being broken down to amino acids. The amino acids are composed of a carbon skeleton and an amino group. The carbon skeletons are going to be used for energy, perhaps in a fasting state, or in a fed state, they're going to be used to synthesize other compounds, other nitrogen-containing compounds. The am ammonia that's released from the amino acid, that's going to be excreted in the urea cycle. Okay, it's going to be used to make urea and excreted, uh, collected in the kidneys, excreted in the urine, or the free ammonia itself can be excreted in the urine as well. All right, let's overview protein digestion in the same way that we did for carbohydrates. Okay, in the same way that we did for car carbohydrates. Let's assume that uh, for breakfast uh, in the morning we ate a, a steak, and then we had some chicken, and then maybe we had some, some beans, protein rich, and, and uh, we, we just filled ourselves with protein, ate a lot of egg whites, okay? drank some uh, egg white shake. Well, the, the point is that you've eaten a lot of protein. Now, how is the protein going to be degraded? It's going to be degraded in a different way than the carbohydrates were. If you remember back to carbohydrates, their degradation begins almost immediately by salivary amylase in the mouth. The proteins, not much is going to happen to them. They're going to pass through the mouth, down the esophagus, and once they reach the stomach, Okay, the low pH of the stomach is going to activate pepsinogen into pepsin. And that's going to basically take a big protein and start chopping it up into smaller usable fragments. Okay, into usable fragments. Don't forget your, your cell biology here. What cell type within the stomach is responsible for secreting hydrochloric acid? Okay, it's the parietal cell. Okay, it's if looking at our slide here, it's the parietal cell. 
the parietal cell is going to be responsible for secreting uh, the, the acid that lowers the pH of the stomach. Do you remember which cell within the stomach secretes the pepsinogen? Okay, think of chief pepsin. Okay, chief pepsin. He's the big dog, chief pepsin. So the chief cells, the chief cells within the stomach are going to secrete the pepsinogen. The low pH, the acidity of the stomach, it takes the pepsinogen's inactive zymogen, it cleaves it and activates it into pepsin. Okay, now within the intestinal lumen, once the, the, the contents of the stomach, the protein contents have been broken down, pass into the lumen of the intestine, that's where the real degradation is going to start. That's where the real degradation is going to start. Now, there's going to be bicarbonate that's released from the pancreas. Now, wh why is that necessary? Well, the low pH contents coming from the stomach into the intestines have to be neutralized. And so the pancreas is going to secrete bicarbonate, which will then raise the pH back up. So as the contents enter from the stomach into the duodenum, down into the fur uh, further distal parts of the intestines, the pH needs to be a little bit higher. And that's the job of the pancreatic bicarbonate. In addition, the pancreas is going to secrete some other zymogens. Okay, it's going to secrete trypsinogen, chymotrypsinogen, proelastase, procarboxypeptidase. All of these pancreatic zymogens are going to be secreted from the pancreas. They're going to get through that duodenal papilla into the duodenum, and that's where they're going to start chewing up the protein, that's the, the smaller protein fragments now that are passing through. Okay, keep in mind that they're, sec they're secreted from the pancreas as inactive zymogens. They then get activated within the contents, within the context of the small intestines. Now, why is that? Well, the reason for that is, is that you don't want these inactive, or these inactive zymogens to be activated before they get to the intestines. If that happened, they would look for proteins within the cells of the pancreas and the, the bile duct, the pancreatic duct there, and just start chewing things up, start chewing things up. So uh, that's why you don't want them activated until they reach the, uh, the, the lumen of the intestines. And actually, it's going to be uh, the trypsin, the trypsin itself, that's going to get the whole uh, sequence of zymogen activation rolling. Okay, now, looking back at our slide here, within the intestinal mucosa, within the intestinal mucosa then, these amino acids are going to be absorbed in the di and tripeptide and monopeptide or mono amino acid form. So you're once again going to have a sodium, amino acid symporter, very similar to what we saw for a carbohydrate metabolism. As sodium moves down its concentration gradient, the amino acids are going to be pulled into the intestinal mucosal cells, okay, usually as just a single amino acid. There are di and tripeptides that get absorbed as well, but it's usually single amino acids. Why are we talking about this, okay? This is a board review. The reason we're talking about this is because there's going to be two diseases. There's going to be two diseases shown here on your slide. Okay, that's going to be heart and up disease, and it's going to be cystinuria. Heart and up and cystinuria. In heart and up disease, there's a defect in the transport of large neutral amino acids. Okay, this is going to be a fact that you have to remember. Large neutral amino acids are not going to be adequately transported into the intestinal mucosal cells. Okay, well, what is that? That's actually the case both for the intestines and for the kidney, and for the kidney. What's going to happen as a result? Well, first of all, you're not going to get good absorption of your large neutral amino acids. Secondly, you're not going to get good reabsorption of the ones that do happen to get into the circulation. So in the level of the kidney, any of them that get absorbed, they're just going to be simply lost. They're going to be lost within the, uh, within the urine. Now, what are some of the defects seen in heart and up disease clinically? Well, they're going to be pellagra-like symptoms. Do you remember what those were, the pellagra-like symptoms? Remember pellagra, it's a deficiency in niacin, so you're not getting enough niacin in the diet. And as a result, you get the three Ds, okay? You get the diarrhea, the dementia, the dermatitis, 
If it's not treated, you get the fourth D, which is death. Okay, so got to do something about, about pellagra. By the same token, in heart and up disease, you're going to have a pellagra-like syndrome. Okay, you get that black sort of necklace, necklace-looking uh, 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 dermatitis around the neck. Now, why is this the case for heart and up disease? Well, if you remember back, one of the key amino acids that we could synthesize niacin from is tryptophan. And tryptophan is a large neutral amino acid. So if you have a defect in bringing tryptophan into the, the intestinal mucosal cells, well, you're going to have pellagra-like symptoms. Okay, so make sure you, you make that connection. You make that connection there. Large neutral amino acids. Now, the next disease shown over here is cystinuria. Is cystinuria. In cystinuria, there's a defective transport of basic, of basic amino acids, and there's also a defect in the transport of cystine. Okay, cystine. What is cystine? Cystine is basically two cysteines that come together. They undergo an oxidation reaction so that you form that disulfide linkage. Okay, two cysteines come together. They form a, a disulfide linkage. That is cystine. Now, cystine is pretty insoluble. It's pretty insoluble, and so there has to be a specific transporter to help transport this um, within, within the kidney. And in cystinuria, this transporter is going to be defective, so cystine is going to accumulate, and of course you're going to get kidney stones. Okay, you're going to get kidney stones, and that's, that's renal stones, kidney stones. It actually can also lead to recurrent urinary tract infections. So those are the two of the sequelae of cystinuria. A typical question, you know, they, they, they talk about a, a patient that comes in with recurrent bladder infections or persistent kidney stones and they have some sort of metabolic disorder. What is that metabolic disorder? Well, it, it could likely be cystinuria. It could likely be cystinuria or even uh, infection with other, uh, other uh, microbes, microbes, things like uh, Proteus mirabilis, okay, they, that leads to frequent kidney stones. So a lot of these, these things are going to be on the same differential and you're going to have to be able to, um, to decide uh, for cystinuria that this is a defective transport of cystine and also basic amino acids. Okay, very good. The next thing we're going to do is to overview nitrogen metabolism. All right, we've already talked about how proteins get broken down. Okay, you've got a protein coming in. It's going to be broken down into a carbon skeleton and a, an amino group, and those are going to be dealt with. Let's talk a little bit more uh, in detail about how that happens. So looking at our slide here, we see that in, within muscle, muscle, you should think of this as the storehouse for protein. This is where most of the protein in your body resides, within the skeletal muscle. So within the muscle, you're going to have degradation. There's going to be normal turnover of protein. Okay, proteins, that's healthy. It's healthy for proteins to get turned over. But when you start entering a fasting state, you're going to get pretty rapid breakdown of your skeletal muscle. Why is that? It's because those carbon skeletons can then be used to make energy. So let's assume that now uh, we're either in a fasting state or we're in a, in a state where the muscle is breaking down protein. So let's take another look here at the amino acids. The first step in the breakdown of amino acids is going to be catalyzed by a family of enzymes called transaminases. Okay, think of the name transaminase. The job of a transaminase is to take the amino group from the amino acid to strip that amino group and to transfer that amino group to what's called a corresponding alpha keto acid. Okay, let's, let's look at that again. So you have an amino acid. The amino group is going to be removed from that amino acid. When you remove um, amino groups from an amino acid, you generate what's called a corresponding alpha keto acid. The amino group itself is going to be uh, indirectly passed off to an, a corresponding alpha keto acid. When this alpha keto acid picks up an amino group, notice this arrow, it's going to be converted to a different alpha amino acid. Okay, so the net effect. I like to think of this amino group like a hot potato. Okay, it's a hot potato that, that's going to got to be gotten rid of. What's going to happen to this hot potato? 
the, the first, the, the amino group being the hot potato, the amino group is going to give it to another alpha keto acid. And that alpha keto acid now becomes an amino acid. But it doesn't want that hot potato, so it's going to give that amino group to another alpha keto acid. And then that alpha keto acid is going to be turned into then an amino acid. Okay, let's take a look. So this amino acid is going to pass off its amino group to this alpha keto acid. In turn, this becomes an amino acid. This amino acid can now pass off its amino group to another alpha keto acid, pyruvate being one. And in turn, this becomes a different amino acid. This generates the corresponding alpha keto acid. Now, for each amino acid, there's going to be a different transaminase that's responsible for, for catalyzing this, these reactions. An important point here, the vitamin that's required for transamination reaction, vitamin B6. Okay, vitamin B6 is important for transamination reactions. So let's, let's look here. Notice that the main amino acid that gets released from muscle is going to be alanine. Alanine is the main amino acid. It's released from muscle. And where does the alanine go? It's going to go to the liver. It's going to go to the liver, and right away, it's going to undergo the amino shuffle, the hot potato handoff here. Okay, it's going to, going to hand off all of its amino groups. What's it going to hand them off to? Let's, let's look here. Alanine is going to hand off its amino group once again to alpha ketoglutarate. In the process, alpha ketoglutarate is converted to glutamate, an amino acid. In the process, the alanine amino acid gets converted to its corresponding alpha keto acid, which is pyruvate. Why is this important? Well, if this is during the, the fasting state, pyruvate, you know, is an important gluconeogenic precursor. Do you remember the enzyme? What's the enzyme that takes pyruvate and starts plugging it into gluconeogenesis? Okay, it's not pyruvate dehydrogenase. It's not lactate dehydrogenase. It's pyruvate carboxylase. Pyruvate carboxylase. So in this way, alanine from muscle is actually a gluconeogenic precursor. And this can help maintain blood glucose levels during a, a fasting state. But that's not the end of the story. Okay, the, looking back at our figure, you see that alpha ketoglutarate became glutamate when it picked up the amino group from alanine. Well, glutamate is important because it can go in a couple of different directions. And it, as a matter of fact, it has to go in two different directions. It can undergo a dehydrogenation reaction, an oxidation reduction reaction, glutamate can. And in this oxidation reduction reaction, you generate free ammonia. Okay, within the confines of the liver, it's okay to generate free ammonia. It's okay. Why? It's because you're going to see a lot of the urea cycle operating within, within the liver. So the, the generating the free ammonia there, not a problem. What else can happen to glutamate? Glutamate can take its amino group and pass it to oxaloacetate. Okay? Once again, a transamination reaction is taking its amino group, passing it to an alpha keto acid. In the process, you generate another amino acid. In the process, you generate the corresponding alpha keto acid. This transaminase happens to be called aspartate transaminase. Okay, we, we sometimes abbreviate that AST, AST. Whereas alanine transaminase would be abbreviated ALT, ALT. We'll get back to that in a second. So why is this necessary? This step is necessary because aspartate must enter into the urea cycle to, to adequately produce urea. That's the whole reason for aspartate transaminase uh, being present. We'll talk about the urea cycle itself in a little bit more detail, but think of the uh, amino group being coming in from glutamate in the form of ammonia, and then aspartate coming in, going through this cycle, the end product of which is going to be urea. The end product of this cycle is urea. What happens to the urea? It's generated mostly in the liver, it's collected in the kidney, and it goes out in the urine. It goes out in the urine. So that's the major route of nitrogen disposal. Okay, your skeletal muscle, the alanine, remember alanine, it's leaving the muscle, going to the liver. The liver is going to then uh, work on that alanine. It's going to go transamination reactions, which are eventually going to produce urea. The carbon skeletons are going to be broken down for energy. Now, 
let's get back to ALT and AST for a second. When you do, later on, when you order liver function tests for your, your patients and you, and you look at, at uh, liver values, liver uh, markers for da damage, it's primarily going to be ALT and AST that you look at. Okay, so those are the two big liver enzyme markers, ALT and AST. They're going to be used to diagnose liver damage. You can even compare the ratio of ALT to AST to determine whether a patient is perhaps cirrhotic due to chronic alcohol use, or maybe they have hepatitis due to, to viral infection. So this ALT-AST ratio is going to be uh, quite important. All right, let's, uh, let's look now back at our slide. Let's now look at, the, um, at this here where we say, see most tissues. Okay, in many tissues, there's going to be, for some reason or other, spontaneous deamination or deamination that happens as a result of, of metabolism itself. As I said, ammonia is toxic to tissues. So what the body does to try to get rid of ammonia is to take the ammonia, combine it with glutamate, react it with glutamate, and when you do that, you actually form glutamine. You form glutamine. You, you can take glutamate, combine it with ammonia, form an amide linkage, and now instead of having free ammonia, the ammonia is pretty much tied up in the form of glutamine. The important enzyme there, it's called glutamine synthetase. So in any question that's asked of you, perhaps for a glutamine synthetase deficiency, what's going to be the problem? It's going to be hyperammonemia. And you need to, we'll talk about this, but you need to be able to recognize the signs of hyperammonemia. They're going to be quite similar to what, what uh, you saw maybe for ethanol consumption, okay? Confusion, uh, uh, mental incapacitation. Of course, it's going to be much more severe for the ammonia intoxication than it was for ethanol intoxication, uh, so it, it needs to be dealt with. Okay, so in most of these tissues, the glutamine is going to be released into the bloodstream. This is an uncharged amino acid, okay, so you don't want to release glutamate because that has a charge that would lower the pH of the blood. So what gets released is glutamine. It's the major transport form of ammonia, and believe it or not, of all amino acids in the bloodstream, glutamine, glutamine is the most abundant amino acid in the bloodstream over all the other amino acids. It's the most popular amino acid in the blood. Now what happens to that glutamine? It can get to other tissues, but it, actually one of the tissues that really like glutamine, likes to use glutamine as a source of energy, will be the intestines. So within the intestines, within the intestines, the glutamine can be taken up, and then there's an enzyme called glutaminase. Glutaminase is going to take the glutamine, it's going to break off the, uh, the ammonia group, and the, because we're within the intestines now, this can go into the portal circulation, and be delivered directly to the liver. Okay, there's a nice portal circulation going from intestinal epithelial cells to the liver, and this portal circulation, it's okay to have elevated ammonia. It's kind of a, a it's, it's a, a sheltered off circulation. It doesn't get out into the systemic circulation. The other fate of glutamine here, the other fate is that glutamine can get to the kidney. It can actually get filtered out by the kidney. In the kidney, there's also a renal glutaminase, there's a renal glutaminase, and within the kidney, the ammonia can be released that way. When it gets released directly in the kidney, it'll be excreted as ammonia. So urea is the major waste product. Ammonia is the minor waste product. Please don't confuse urea with uric acid, okay? I could see you on the board exam, uh, you know, reading your computer screen, reading through quickly. It's a stressful situation and you're reading something in the answer choices and you see uric acid and right away you clue in on uric acid, please don't do that, okay? Urea and uric acid, they sound a little bit alike, but they're not the same thing. Uric acid is a degradation product of purine, purines, whereas urea is the nitrogen waste disposal product, okay? You're gonna know uric acid as being important for, for of course, gout, for gout. Okay, let's take a look specifically at the urea cycle. At the urea cycle, that's what we're looking at on this next slide. The, how do we, first of all, how do we measure uh, urea by blood tests? 
we usually look at the BUN. On every blood test, to look at, at, at urea levels, we measure the BUN. Okay, what does that stand for? It stands for blood urea nitrogen. So that's BUN is basically a measure of how much urea is being produced in the liver. And of course, then how much urea is also being filtered out by the kidneys. So it can help look at kidney function. It can help look at liver function. If the kidney's dysfunctional, if the kidney's dysfunctional, the BUN is going to rise in the blood. Why is that? It's because the kidney's not filtering out all of the urea. If the liver is dysfunctional, the BUN is going to drop. And why is that? It's because the hepatocytes are where the, BU, the urea is going to be made. So if there's a drop in the BUN, this is going to be more indicative of liver dysfunction. If there's a rise in the BUN, that's going to be more indicative of kidney dysfunction. And usually in these tests, they'll normalize the BUN to creatinine levels. If you remember what creatinine is, it's a degradation product of creatine, creatine being the storage molecule. As creatine gets broken down, it gets converted into creatine, cre excuse me, as it gets broken down, it gets converted into creatinine. This creatinine is going to be cleared by the kidney at a kind of a, a normal, consistent rate. So we can use that as a, as a marker to normalize the BUN. So you usually compare BUN to creatinine. So, so it would be a BUN to creatinine ratio to help measure uh, these dysfunctions. All right, let's, let's look at the slide here because there's a couple of important metabolic diseases that are gonna come along, just like with everything else in biochemistry. So in the urea cycle, you have ammonia, okay? There's gonna be some bicarbonate and there's going to be ATP. These react together to make the molecule carbamoyl phosphate. Carbamoyl phosphate is the first, first uh, molecule in the urea cycle. This step is catalyzed by an enzyme called carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 1. There's going to be two different types of carbamoyl phosphate synthetase. There's a synthetase 1. This is operating within the urea cycle. And then there's a carb carbamoyl phosphate synthetase 2. And that's going to be operating within the pyrimidine synthesis pathway. This is going to be important, okay? The, the one is within urea, two is within pyrimidine synthesis because there's obviously going to be a carbamyl phosphate synthetase deficiency that can arise. Not a very common disease, but it has been commonly tested on the boards. A carbamyl phosphate can then can, uh, basically bind to ornithine, can bind to ornithine to make the molecule citrulline. There's another important enzyme here called ornithine transcarbamylase. Ornithine transcarbamylase takes ornithine and transfers it to carbamyl phosphate. So it's a transcarbamylase. And this is now going to be citrulline. As you guessed, there's going to be a deficiency here called ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. This deficiency is going to lead to similar symptoms that you saw for carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1. Both of these are going to lead to hyperaminemia because this ammonia that's coming in won't be dealt with. Instead, it will build up. Okay, keep in mind that the first steps here of the cycle work within the mitochondrial matrix. The rest of the steps in the urea cycle are going to be working in the cytoplasm. Okay, that's probably a low to medium yield fact. I would remember, uh, try to remember where these pathways are occurring for glycolysis and fatty acid synthesis and cholesterol biosynthesis. That's much more important than remembering where in, in the cell, specifically, the urea cycle works. All right, so now citrulline, we have citrulline coming into the cytoplasm. It's going to undergo a couple of reactions here. First of all, arginino-succinate synthetase, and then arginino-succinate lyase. It's then under, going to undergo an arginase reaction. This is probably beyond these first two. The other important enzyme to remember is arginase, is arginase. Why? Why remember arginase? It's because it's the enzyme that's responsible for cleaving off the urea molecule from arginine. So arginase would pretty much be the last enzyme of the urea cycle. Because when you have arginine and you clip off the urea, what's left over? It's going to be ornithine. And that restarts the cycle. The ornithine can go back into the mitochondria into the matrix, and it can combine with carbamyl phosphate 
to start the cycle all over again. So that, that's the urea cycle. Some take-home points, some take-home points from the urea cycle. Uh, first of all, the urea. Uh, if you notice the urea that gets made in this cycle, that gets made in this cycle, it's going to then enter the bloodstream from the, from the liver. It's going to be filtered out by the kidneys. And of course, it's going to be excreted into the urine. It's going to be excreted into the urine. Let's compare urea cycle defects because this is going to be on the, these, these deficiencies are going to be on the same differential and you're going to have to be able to differentiate between the two. So first on the left here we have carbamyl phosphate synthetase deficiency and on the right we have ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. Now on, notice that in both of these diseases there's going to be elevated ammonia, hyperammonemia, the body's going to attempt, it's going to attempt to get rid of the ammonia. How does it attempt to get rid of the ammonia? Well, remember glutamine synthetase. It, you can take, the body can take glutamate, combine it with ammonia to make glutamine. And the glutamine is a non-toxic, uh, basically ammonia carrying molecule. So the body's gonna fight it off. It's gonna fight off the hyperammonemia so the, the levels of glutamine are increased, but that's not gonna be enough to, to win the, the war here. So as a result, of course, you're going to get symptoms of, of hyperammonemia, which are shown down here, the cere cerebral edema. You can get lethargy, convulsions, coma, CNS-type symptoms. It can even lead to death. So uh, very serious diseases here. Now, diagnostically, in, in these deficiencies, you're going to see the BUN is decreased. Why is that? It's because the body's not able to make the BUN. Okay, assuming that this isn't a total wipeout of enzyme activity, it's, it's a you know, partial deficiency in enzyme activity, the body can still make some BUN, but it's going to be decreased. The levels are decreased. Now, this is how we're going to differentiate between these two defects. In carbamyl phosphate synthetase, there is no increase in uracil or erotic acid. Why is that? If you remember back to what I said, there's two carbamyl phosphate synthetase enzymes. There was CPS1, which exists in the urea cycle, and then there was CPS2, which exists within the pyrimidine synthesis pathway. Well, uracil and erotic acid are intermediates in the pyrimidine synthesis pathway. So if you don't have carbamyl phosphate synthetase 1 deficiency, you're not going to have carbamyl phosphate leaking out into the out of the mitochondria into the cytoplasm to be a substrate uh, for for pyrimidine synthesis pathways. Okay, let me explain from the point of view of ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency. In ornithine transcarbamylase deficiency, you do see an increase in both uracil and orotic acid. Okay, this increase will be seen in the blood and the urine but you do see an increase in uracil and orotic acid. Why is this? It's because there's not a defect in, in this disease in the carbamyl phosphate synthetase. So within the mitochondria, the carbamyl phosphate will be synthesized, but it can't go any further. It's trapped. It can't be reacted with ornithine transcarbamylase because that's deficient. So what happens to that carbamyl phosphate? It leaks out of the mitochondria and it then enters the pyrimidine synthesis pathway. Okay, so that's why in ornithine transcarbamylase, you will see an increase in uracil and orotic acid. How can you remember that? Well, if you just remember O for ornithine and O for orotic acid, it's not erotic, it's orotic acid, okay? O for ornithine and O for orotic acid, that's going to uh, help you remember that fact. So the next thing we're gonna take a look at is the breakdown of amino acids. There's a large figure in your textbook that I've divided into two just because it's so doggone big. Okay, so let's look at the top half of this figure first. A lot of the times we'll call this pathway the vomit pathway. Why is that? It's because you look at it and it makes you wanna vomit, right? We call it the vomit pathway because there's specific um, there's specific things that are involved in this pathway. For example, the vomit stands for letters of, of amino acids. The V is for valine, the I is for isoleucine, the T is for threonine, the O is for odd chain fatty acids, 
Okay, and the M, the M is for methionine. This whole pathway involves all of those molecules. So it's the vomit pathway. Let's make, let's, let's uh, explain this so you don't want to vomit. Okay, let's take a look at this pathway. Let's start out with phenylalanine. With phenylalanine um, degradation, the first thing that you notice that, that these enzymes are eventually going to enter the TCA cycle. They're eventually going to enter the TCA cycle. So these are actually glucogenic amino acids. But for phenylalanine, the first step in, in phenylalanine degradation is actually conversion to tyrosine. It's actually conversion to tyrosine. So not only is this a, a degradation pathway for phenylalanine, but it's actually the way by which tyrosine is synthesized. Now, important enzyme here, one that you got to know, the boards love this enzyme, it's phenylalanine hydroxylase. Phenylalanine hydroxylase takes phenylalanine, phenylalanine is basically alanine with a phenyl group on it, and this enzyme is just going to add a little hydroxyl group to that phenyl ring. So now we go from being phenylalanine to being tyrosine, to being tyrosine. You need to know the name of the enzyme, phenylalanine hydroxylase, and you need to know the name of the cofactor that's involved here. It's called tetrahydrobiopterin. Tetrahydrobiopterin, that's a necessary cofactor for this enzyme. Why do you need to know? You already knew the answer to this. It's because the disease phenylketonuria. Let's take a look at phenylketonuria. In phenylketonuria, which is abbreviated PKU for short, there's gonna be several consistent clinical findings uh, mental retardation being one of them, and microcephaly being uh, one of them in a pregnant mother, a mother suffering from PKU would, that's not being treated adequately, would give birth to a child, a child that is microcephalic, that is microcephalic. So mental retardation, microcephaly, very indicative of PKU. Um, in addition, there's going to be um, other, other findings. Uh, typically, the urine would have a, a what they say, a, a musty smell, a musty smell. So uh, this, if a patient comes in and, and the urine smells musty, well, that would be indicative of, of PKU. How do you treat this? Well, you simply give the patient a dietary restriction of phenylalanine. Okay, you want to avoid phenylalanine, keeping in mind that many artificial sweeteners, in particular aspartame, Aspartame contains phenylalanine, so you'd want your patient to avoid uh, avoid dietary beverages and things like that that contain aspartame. And it's especially important if a, a PKU pregnant woman that she avoid phenylalanine during her pregnancy. Going to have to get some because you need some phenylalanine, but you're definitely going to want to tightly monitor this. Now, the incidence of these, this disease one in a quarter million, okay? One in 200 or 250,000 people will get this disease, but it's very commonly, much, much more commonly tested on the boards. As a matter of fact, PKU is one of the, the diseases that's tested right after birth in all children in, in the United States, okay? PKU, so uh, that along with galactosemia are two diseases that you'll very, um, very unlikely to see in your clinical practice unless perhaps you're destined to be a uh, neonatologist or pediatrician. So the next disease we'll talk about is alcaptonuria. Alcaptonuria. This is a cool disease. Not for, probably for the people that have it, but it's, it's interesting to discuss. So homogentisic acid. Homogentisic acid is a degradation product of tyrosine. Tyrosine gets broken down to homogentisic acid, and then in order, this is very insoluble, so the homogentisic acid ends up getting converted to malleal acetoacetate and then enters into the TCA cycle. The enzyme to remember here, homogentisate oxidase. Homogentisate oxidase is the defective enzyme in, in alcaptonuria. So in alcaptonuria, this is what's going to be indicative of these patients. It's going to be dark urine. Now the urine isn't dark right away. So typically a patient would urinate and then that would get oxidized by the air and it would just magically turn dark. Okay, that that's, uh, sounds like a party prank you might play on somebody. So typically a patient would urinate and then all of a sudden it would turn dark. Another feature of alcaptonuria, um, one that's probably uh, more of a problem, is the ochronosis. So if you looked at the bones and the joints of a patient with alcaptonuria, 
they would accumulate a black pigment, a dark black pigment, and the best we can tell is that predisposes one towards osteoarthritis, okay, maybe early development of osteoarthritis due to the accumulation of this, this pigment within the, the bones and the joints. So alcaptonuria, rare disease, make sure you remember it's a deficiency in homogentosate oxidase. Okay, moving on to our, our slide here. Notice leucine, valine, and isoleucine. These are branch chain amino acids, okay? Branch chain amino acids. We talked about them a little bit earlier. They have branches in their structure. They have branches in their structure. And we, how did we remember these? We remembered I love Vermont maple syrup, okay? A lot of maple syrup. The maple trees grow up in Vermont. So if you remember I love Vermont maple syrup, this will help you remember that isoleucine, leucine, and valine are the three amino acids that accumulate in maple syrup urine disease. How do we know, uh, how, do, how do we diagnose maple syrup urine disease? A patient, uh, typically a child, would present with, with urine that has the odor of maple syrup, that has the odor of maple syrup. Uh, the patient would suffer mental retardation. They would have abnormal muscle tone. They would have CNS symptoms, uh, perhaps coma, and eventually death. They actually get a ketosis that's going to occur as a result. So uh, it needs to be treated. Of course, how would it be treated? You would limit the amount of branch chain amino acids within the diet. So here's the defect. The defect is in an enzyme called branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase. Branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase. So there's actually a couple steps in the degradation of these. The first step is a transamination, just with, like with all amino acids. The first step is that the amino acid will have the amino group removed and transferred to a corresponding alpha keto acid. But the, uh, the, what's left behind is now an alpha keto acid, and this alpha keto acid needs to be oxidized further, and that's the job of the branch chain keto acid dehydrogenase. If that enzyme's defective, these alpha keto acids are going to build up. Okay, that's going to lead to the ketosis that you see in the disease. So remember the enzyme name, remember the disease. Can you think of a cofactor? We discussed this a little bit earlier, but can you think of the cofactor that's one cofactor that's very important for this enzyme? Okay, a dehydrogenase enzymes. Think of pyruvate dehydrogenase. Think of alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase. It's thiamine. Okay, thiamine. Thiamine is very important for this enzyme. Now, why is that important to you clinically and for your boards? It's because, remember, in thiamine deficiency, it could lead to wet beriberi, which could cause congestive heart failure and pitting edema. Why is that important? The reason it's important is because your heart relies on branched chain uh, amino acids for its energy. So if there's a thiamine deficiency, which thiamine is important for breaking down the branch chain amino acids, then the heart's not going to get enough energy to do what it needs to do. So that's the link between uh, branch chain amino acids and cardiac failure. Let's move uh, on to the pathway here. Once again, a, a couple of smaller details you'll notice. Not too likely they're going to ask you about this on the, the, uh, the boards nowadays. They, they don't tend to ask these questions anymore. But leucine is a ketogenic amino acid. Leucine is a ketogenic amino acid, meaning that it gets converted to acetyl-CoA. Whereas valine and isoleucine, they are typ typically going to be glucogenic amino acid. Actually, isoleucine can go in either direction, but valine definitely is a glucogenic amino acid, meaning it can be converted up eventually to sugar, whereas leucine is going to be converted directly to acetyl-CoA. Okay, so, so now that we've talked about uh, the top half here of the pathway, let's now look at the bottom half of this pathway. So what is vitamin B12 deficiency going to lead to? It's going to lead to a buildup of methyl malonate. So we call this a methyl malonic aciduria. What were the two enzymes? Let's review. What were the two enzymes that required vitamin B12? There are methyl malonyl CoA mutase and homocysteine methyltransferase. Those are the two enzymes in the body that require B12. Now looking right here, we see that methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, either if the enzyme is deficient 
or if vitamin B12 is not there in abundant amounts, it's not going to function adequately. And so, looking at our picture, you see that methylmalonate is going to build up. Okay, this is going to back up. So if you remember the, the fatty acids that contain an odd number of carbons, that contain an odd number of carbons, are going to uh, be converted to propionyl-CoA. They then are going to get carboxylated to form methylmalonyl-CoA. They're going to get carboxylated, so they go from being a three carbon to being a four carbon uh, containing fatty acid, and that methylmalonyl-CoA has to then be converted into succinyl-CoA. This is the step, methylmalonyl-CoA mutase, that requires that vitamin B12. Okay, now we're gonna look at the bottom half of this pathway. Okay, we've broken this up into two, remember. In the bottom half, we're gonna focus on methionine, the, the amino acid methionine. A lot of important biochemistry here and things that the boards can easily, easily test you on. So notice that methionine is going to be synthesized from homocysteine, there's an enzyme here called homocysteine methyltransferase. Okay, we just mentioned that that's one of the two enzymes in the human body that require B12. Beautiful thing about this figure, it shows both of the enzymes that require B12, both homocysteine methyltransferase and also methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. So looking at the methionine pathway, in order for methionine to be degraded, it's first converted to S-adenosylmethionine. We know this molecule as SAM. S-adenosylmethionine, we call it Big Sam. It then gets converted to what I call the son of Sam. Okay, the son of Sam is S-adenosyl homocysteine. So Sam, as it gets converted to S-adenosyl homocysteine, it donates a methyl group. So S-adenosylmethionine is an important methyl group donor. What is this important for? This is going to be important to donate this methyl group uh, when, when you think about converting norepinephrine to epinephrine, that's a ep uh, methylation step. When you think about methylating, uh, when you think about methylating DNA, okay, to, to help silence the DNA sequence, that's another another place where you, you're impo it's important to involve methylation. So there's many different steps biochemically that require methylation. You should think of S-adenosylmethionine as an important methyl donor. So. As S-adenosylmethionine gets converted to S-adenosyl homocysteine, eventually the adenosyl moiety is going to drop off, and what's left over is homocysteine. If you remember, though, homocysteine is a very reactive compound, extremely reactive compound. So it can actually, if it builds up in the blood, it can start oxidizing lipid membranes. That can lead to atherosclerosis. Uh, homocysteine can, al can also lead to elevated levels, can lead to dislocated lenses. It can cause problems, it can cause deep vein thromboses, okay, leading to pulmonary emboli. So homocysteine levels, very, very important. I, I, it's likely the board will test you on homocysteine. So be familiar. Um, in, in addition to these, what I've discussed, elevated homocysteine levels can also lead to mental retardation. So let's, let's now describe uh, some ways in which homocysteine can build up. Some ways in which it can build up. It could build up if there's a problem in homocysteine methyltransferase. If homocysteine can't be broken down to methionine, if it can't be broken down to methionine, it's going to be built up, it's gonna build up. If there's a deficiency in either folic acid, okay, N5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, so that, remember tetrahydrofolate is the cofactor form of folic acid. If there's a deficiency in either folic acid or vitamin B12, this enzyme is not going to be able to convert homocysteine to methionine. If there's a deficiency in cystathionine synthase, that's the enzyme that converts homocysteine into cystathionine, into cystathionine. So if there's a defect in cystathionine synthase or, or a defect in vitamin B6, it can lead to homocystinuria. So there's some common themes here. Let's look over. Enzyme deficiencies such as homocysteine methyltransferase and cystathionine synthase, they can lead to homocystinuria, but that's going to be a little bit rare. What's going to be more commonly seen, what's going to be more commonly seen is that vitamin deficiencies, vitamin deficiencies are going to lead to homocystinuria, and which vitamins specifically? The vitamins specifically are going to be vitamin B6, vitamin B12, and then folic acid. Those are the three important, uh, important groups, important uh, vitamins 
that, when defective, can lead to homocystinuria. All right, the, the most important points from homocystinuria, once again, atherosclerosis, deep vein thromboses, dislocated lenses, and possibility for mental retardation. Okay, the next thing we're going to look at is folate metabolism. Once again, this in conjunction with vitamin B12 deficiency is going to be something you definitely have to discriminate between on, on the exam. So why do we need folate? We need folate not only for DNA synthesis, but also for breakdown of homocysteine as we just saw. So we need it for both. In the absence of, of proper folate metabolism, you won't be able to adequately synthesize DNA and you won't be able to break down your homocysteine. So that's what we're going to see. We're going to see the homocystinuria, and as a res an ability to not properly make DNA, we're going to see megaloblastic anemia manifested. So looking at this pathway, we call this the folate trap hypothesis. You take in folate in your diet, that's the vitamin form. You take in folate in your diet, that's the vitamin form. And then an enzyme called dihydrofolate reductase, important enzyme to remember, dihydrofolate reductase, actually converts uh, folate to dihydrofolate and then into tetrahydrofolate, catalyzes both steps. These are coenzymes. These are the, the forms of the enzyme, uh, excuse me, the forms of the vitamin that the enzyme is going to use for its activity. There's a, a whole host of enzymes that require folic acid. We'll talk about just a few that the boards expect you to know. So, so the reason that, that we need folate as a cofactor is for reactions where one carbon units are added to other molecules. So if, if another vitamin that did this was vitamin B12, but anytime you need to take a carbon unit and add it to a substrate, folic acid can be a cofactor. Now, there's very varying forms of folic acid. There's, there's 4-mil tetrahydrofolate, methanyl, methylene tetrahydrofolate. There's varying forms of folic acid that are active forms. There's also a reduced form. Now, during its, its, its lifetime or its life cycle here, the varying forms of folic acid can eventually be converted to methyl tetrahydrofolate. Okay, can be converted to methyl tetrahydrofolate. This is what we think of as the storage pool, the storage pool of folic acid. So what are these going to be used for? These are going to be used to make purines, okay, your cytosine, uracil, and thymidine, going to be critically important for that. These are necessary for DNA and RNA cell division. So the problem is going to come about here. The problem is going to come about when there's a block in this pathway. Now, why would there be a block in this pathway? There would be a block in this pathway if perhaps you're not getting in enough dietary folate to begin with, so there's a folate deficiency. There could be a deficiency if homocysteine methyltransferase is defective, or more, even more commonly, if vitamin B12 is deficient. If vitamin B12 is deficient, then there's going to be a block in this pathway. Now, why does that cause a problem? The reason it causes a problem is because when folate's in the reduced form, the methyl tetrahydrofolate form, the only way it can get released from this form and be converted back to tetrahydrofolate is via vitamin B12 dependent homocysteine methyltransferase. So another way of saying that is, is that the conversion of homocysteine to methionine is inextricably linked to the conversion of reduced folate back to tetrahydrofolate. So if one of these is defective, it's going to affect the other. So that's why for both folic acid deficiency or vitamin B12 deficiency, you're going to have a buildup of homocysteine, that's going to cause homocystinuria, and you're actually not going to, you're eventually going to trap all of your folate in the methyl form, and it's not going to be released. What happens as a result? Well, you, you get less active folate, you are, have an inability to make purines and thymidines, and you're going to inhibit DNA and RNA and cell division. How is this manifested? You guessed it, megaloblastic anemia. So megaloblastic anemia is a hallmark deficiency caused by vitamin B12, uh, and, uh, paucity or, or lack of vitamin B12, or uh, folic acid, either one. 
Let's now move to this table uh, that compares folate and vitamin B12 deficiencies. In particular, the USMLE loves these kinds of questions. They love to compare folic acid deficiency with vitamin B12 deficiency, and they want to make sure you can differentiate between the two. Now, both of these deficiencies are going to lead to megaloblastic anemias. They're both going to lead to megaloblastic anemias. But in B12, in addition, you see the progressive peripheral neuropathy. You see the progressive per peripheral neuropathy uh, going on. Both of these can lead to homocystinuria and homocystinemia. That's increased, causes increased risk for cardiovascular disease. But notice down here when this deficiency develops. Folic acid deficiency can happen quite rapidly, usually after just about three or four months of, of, of a lack of that in your diet. Vitamin B12 deficiency, it takes years for this to develop. It takes several uh, years to develop. Why? It's because your liver... This is a little unusual for the liver, but it can actually store vitamin B12. The body doesn't usually store water-soluble vitamins, but vitamin B12 is an exception to this rule. The risk factors, the risk factors for these, they're going to give you little clues to help you answer the question. So the risk factors for folic acid deficiency are usually going to be alcoholism or a pregnant woman. A pregnant woman has elevated uh, requirements for folic acid. Of course, the developing fetus, a lot of DNA synthesis going on, a lot of cell division going on, so she's going to need folic acid supplementation. You know that prenatal vitamins are always going to have uh, some folic acid supplementation. The disease that goes when a pregnant woman is folic acid deficient is what? It's going to be a neural tube defect in the child. Okay, a neural tube defect could be spina bifida cystica, spina bifida occulta, but it's spina bifida and neural tube defects. That's what you see when folic acid is deficient in a pregnant woman. For B12 deficiency, what's going to be uh, the clues for this? It's going to be a patient that has pernicious anemia, uh, a patient that is um, perhaps a vegan patient, not getting in enough, enough animal products. Uh, it could be severe malnutrition, so the, the patient uh, is simply not eating the foods they should to get the vitamins. There's actually one further one. It's infection with diphilobothrium latum, the fish tapeworm. Okay, the, the fish tapeworm is going to, going to steal all of your vitamin B12 from you. So infection with that, uh, that parasite could uh, potentially um, cause a, a B12 deficiency. Another, another uh, thought on that. Think of gastric bypass surgery. A uh, case reads a patient's recently undergone gastric bypass surgery, and you see from the lab values that the patient has megaloblastic anemia. Well, it's going to be vitamin B12 deficiency. It's going to be vitamin B12. And the final uh, differentiation factor that we already alluded to is the peripheral neuropathy. Vitamin B12 deficiency can lead to peripheral neuropathy. Why is that? It's because, of, remember, that methylmalonyl-CoA mutase. Methylmalonyl-CoA mutase requires B12, and if B12 is not there, you get a buildup of methylmalonic acid, methylmalonate, and that's going to build up, that's going to monkey with the, the myelin sheaths, and that's going to prevent a proper uh, nerve impulse transmission, leading to peripheral neuropathy. Let's, uh, let's switch gears a little bit here and uh, revisit the topic of amino acid products. I want to remind you that there's specific products of amino acids that are produced. Okay, so let's look at our chart here. Remember that the amino acid tyrosine, tyrosine is important for making your thyroid hormones, your T3 and T4 thyroid hormones. In addition, it's important for making melanin. Melanin, of course, is the, the pigment, the pigment that, that uh, can make your skin varying uh, levels of, of, uh, of darkness. And, of course, there's a deficiency in tyrosinase, in tyrosinase, which prevents tyrosine conversion to melanin. What's that disease? Albinism. Albinism. It's a deficiency in tyrosinase, which converts tyrosine to melanin. Tyrosine is also an important uh, for the, the catecholamine pathway. So for the synthesis of dopamine and norepinephrine and epinephrine, tyrosine is the precursor molecule. And having said that, what's the precursor molecule for tyrosine? It's phenylalanine. 
phenylalanine, remember, gets converted by phenylalanine hydroxylase from phenylalanine to tyrosine. And if that enzyme's deficient, it leads to PKU. Moving back to our chart, we see that tryptophan, tryptophan can be uh, readily converted into serotonin. Remember, given adequate dietary amounts of tryptophan, it could actually be converted into a niacin. So your NAD and your NADP cofactors, okay, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide and nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate, these can be, uh, these are derived from niacin, but niacin can be synthesized in the body from tryptophan. And serotonin, you know, 5-HT, 5-hydroxy uh, tryptophan, uh, it's known as serotonin, important for mood regulation, behaviors, a lot of uh, therapies are going to target this pathway. So they could ask you a question on the boards where they give you a patient being treated with uh, SSRIs, and they then ask you about the amino acid that that's, that that's going to, uh, serotonin was derived from. So they could, they could come at you from, from different angles on this. Arginine. Arginine is important precursor, remember, for nitric oxide. Nitric oxide is an important signaling molecule, leads to vasodilation within your smooth muscle cells, so you, you get uh, a lowering of your blood pressure. Glutamate. Glutamate can be uh, quite easily converted into GABA, the inhibitory neurotransmitter. So glutamate is a stimulatory neurotransmitter, but it can be easily converted into GABA, which is gamma amino butyric acid. It's just a simple decarboxylation reaction. So you now have an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Histidine. Histidine can be easily decarboxylated and converted into histamine. Histamine. So just remember these amino acids and the products because they may not ask you about the specific biochemistry behind these conversions and they likely won't. They likely won't do that, but they do want you to know the amino acids they're derived from. 